Well, it looks as if we may have to change our concept of middle age. There's amazing new research that finds more and more Americans are living beyond current expectations, not just into their 80s or even their 90s, but on into a second century. Now, before you conjure up images of lonely, dependent people, check out the group of senior senior citizens that Hugh spent time with recently, and you might live to be 100. <laughs> you might. You know, this was a great experience for me because, you know, to think of reaching a milestone like a century of life and then to meet these remarkable people who have already arrived there, there's a lot to learn, as you're going to see. Remember the 1890s? <laughs> Obviously, most of you don't. But for some, in fact, for thousands of Americans, childhood memories actually include scenes like these from the end of the last century. The number of people aged 100 years or older is growing rapidly. It's now estimated there are more than 36,000 centenarians in the country. That's double the number 10 years ago. The proportional rise in centenarians is phenomenal. And we would have to say that this may be the largest or fastest growing subpopulation uh, in our country. People who were born 100 years ago had only a 1 in 400 chance of ever becoming a centenarian. But someone born in 1980 has a 1 in 87 chance. Most of the scientific research on aging has dealt with people in their 60s and 70s. And that's why these two professors in Georgia decided it was high time someone studied centenarians. Leonard Poon and Gloria Clayton wanted to find out what the secrets are to becoming an active and healthy 100-year-old. Well, they studied and tested 96 independent, non-institutionalized centenarians over the past five years, and they were surprised by what they found. Now, you might think that the common thread would be something like diet or exercise or genetics, but these were not among the four main traits that all the Georgia centenarians had in common. We've uncovered four themes that exist among our entire sample, and those are optimism, engagement or commitment to something that they're interested in, activity or mobility, and the ability to adapt to loss. Uh, that seems to be pervasive among all of the centenarians we've studied. A Grand Prix auto race for elderly people at a racetrack in Atlanta, Georgia. You won't find many 100-year-olds here, but there are some very active and very fast senior citizens. But on this morning, there was one centenarian on the racetrack. Geneva McDaniel was celebrating her 105th birthday, and she was determined to take a few laps around the track. Taking a celebrity turn at a racetrack is just one example of how Geneva McDaniel stays active. Here is what she does every morning. One, two, she is the aerobics instructor at her senior center. Not all the centenarians in the study take it quite this far, but almost all of them do some kind of regular physical activity. Now let's put our palms toward our face. This one, two. Anybody that makes it near to the age you've made it is asked, what is the secret? Is there a secret to that? Well, no, there's not a secret for everybody to just do what I tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Well, think positive. Don't think negative. You, you feel bad and you know there's something the matter with you. Forget that and uh, go on in and do what you have to do. Jesse Champion, who lives in Greene County, Georgia, endured years of backbreaking work as a sharecropper. His father was a slave. And Jesse himself can remember the cruelty of people who treated him as a young man as if he were a slave. The Lord let me live see all of them dead. Everyone who treated me bad. You've outlived them. Yeah, I lived them. Yeah. Yes, I did. I thank the Lord. I was enslaved. No. I wonder why they treat me like that. Jesse and his 85-year-old wife, Frony, go to church twice every week. And he, like many of the centenarians I met in Georgia, believes his deep religious faith is the most important thing that's helped him keep going. Are you born again? Yes, sir. Yeah. I know I'm born again. My hand 
look new. My feet look new. Yeah, he changed my heart. I had a hard heart, but he changed it. Mr. Champion represents another key survival characteristic that the scientists in Georgia have discovered, and that is the importance of being passionately involved in something you care about. What would be some examples of that? Well, we call it engagement. engagement. And um, one example that you've seen is Mr. Champion, who is very engaged with his church. Rarely do they open the door that he's not there. And I would would venture a guess that no decision has been made in that church for years that he didn't participate in. I'm trying harder all the time to be a better person, so maybe, maybe the Lord's giving me a little more time to get to be a better person. <laughs> to celebrate her 100th birthday last year, Ruby Crichton decided to take a trip, and the mode of transportation she chose was an unconventional one. So many people say when they hear I've been on the trip, weren't you afraid? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not afraid yet because no one has explained enough about it to me. <laughs> All 96 of the centenarians in the study, like Ruby Crichton, are given a thorough physical exam. OK, now I'm going to take your blood pressure again. Let me just hold your arm. And complete medical histories are taken, histories that go back a long way. You've never had any trouble with your heart or your circulation, have you? Well, I've had an awful heart, a fast heart. Fast? When, uh -huh. when was that? It'd be about 50 years ago, I guess. Uh huh. The nutritionist on our staff is very surprised by some of her data on the centenarians, which indicate that um, of the three groups that we are studying, the centenarians have the highest caloric intake and they eat the largest amount of fat. If we take a look at uh, cholesterol intake, amount of sugar intake and such, they tend to eat whatever they want. Whatever they want. That's right. The scientists so far are baffled as to why the centenarians are able to defy the rules of good nutrition and get away with it. The Rhodes Mansion in Atlanta is one of the city's historic treasures. Matt a couple of huts. But a full-time employee who works here every day as a tour guide is even older than the house is. This is the lady's parlor. The chandelier came from Czechoslovakia. The mansion is 97 Thank years you. old. Elvis Spangenberg, also an historic treasure, is 104. All of the windows on this first floor have the beveled glass transoms. Ms. Spangenberg, who lives in a nearby rooming house, started work here at the mansion seven years ago after working for 40 years as a ticket seller at the Rhodes Movie Theater across the street. The day the theater closed down, she was approached by the administrator at the historic site next door and offered a brand new career at the age of 96. I said, oh, I'm too old and slow to work. He said, you're not slow. Didn't even give me the week off. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's started. what I did. I closed over there Thursday, and the next Thursday I was sitting here. <laughs> Elva never married, but throughout her life, she was extremely close to her family, especially to her brother John. But when he died in 1955, she somehow managed to get on with her life and stay cheerful. As the Georgia scientists found, this ability to cope with loss is another characteristic that healthy centenarians have in common. Dear Stick and Dewey, Josephine, my firstborn, called a friend to take her to hospital. We saw a dramatic and moving example of this when we visited another centenarian, Mrs. Mary Elliott. And as God has willed it, at about 3 o'clock this morning, she breathed her last without suffering. Only one day Kid before our scheduled interview with Mrs. Elliott, she received the shattering news that her 77-year-old daughter, Josephine, had just died of a heart attack. I'm so stunned, I can't comprehend it. But she was determined to go ahead with this interview, partly as a tribute to her daughter. She told us one of her fondest memories of Josephine as an infant. 
but I was carrying her back to her crib. And she laid down on the pillow, put her cheek on her hand, and she said, now, dear God, let's go to sleep. And she knew he'd be with her. And that made me think, as the morning progressed yesterday, in my state of shock, that I had been asked to give back to God the precious gift that he had given me. And just as quietly, just as beautifully. It's hard to talk. That's what it means to me. If you live to be a hundred, you lose a lot. Uh, most of our subjects have lost a spouse. Um, many of them have lost children. All of them have lost siblings. They've lost their peer group, but in some way they're able to Are incorporate that bad? loss in a positive way so that they can go on. Are you basically satisfied with your life? Yes. Yes, okay. The two professors say the biggest surprise of all for them is that in spite of whatever the centenarians' problems may be, there is absolutely no depression among them. Do you think it is wonderful to be alive now? Yes. Oh, emphatic yes. Very good. And that well, positive well, attitude is something the centenarians seem to be able to apply even to their own mortality. I know my time's getting short. I know that one can't help but know that because so few people live to be even a hundred. I, I think I'm coming close to the end now. And um, I, I, I am glad I've been here this long, though, to enjoy all of this. Happy birthday to you. Happy As more and more people live to celebrate birthdays they never thought they would see, there will be a greater opportunity for everyone to discover what we do, that there is indeed much we can learn from spending time with the oldest old. Thank you, thank you. And I hope all of you will live to be a hundred then and keep on going till you get to 105. Thank you. Yeah. 105. Yeah. Hugh and I will be right back to talk more about this. Stay with us. Here, 